Chapter Twenty Four of A Distinguished Provincial at Paris by Honoré de Balzac, translated by Ellen Marriage. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Perry. Chapter Twenty Four. For a month, Lucien's whole time was taken up with supper parties, dinner engagements, breakfasts, and evening parties. He was swept away by an irresistible current into a vortex of dissipation and easy work he no longer thought of the future the power of calculation amid the complications of life is the sign of a strong will which poets weaklings and men who live a purely intellectual life can never counterfeit lucien was living from hand to mouth spending his money as fast as he made it like many another journalist nor did he give so much as a thought to those periodically recurrent days of reckoning which chequer the life of the bohemian in paris so sadly in dress and figure he was a rival for the great dandies of the day coralie like all zealots loved to adorn her idol she ruined herself to give her beloved poet the accoutrements which had so stirred his envy in the garden of the tuileries lucien had wonderful canes and a charming eyeglass he had diamond studs and scarf rings and signet rings besides an assortment of waistcoats marvellous to behold and in sufficient number to match every colour in a variety of costumes his transition to the estate of dandy swiftly followed when he went to the german minister's dinner all the young men regarded him with suppressed envy yet de marsay vandenesse ajuda pinto maxime de troyes rastignac beaudenord manerville and the duc de maufrigneuse gave place to none in the kingdom of fashion men of fashion are as jealous among themselves as women and in the same way lucien was placed between madame de montcornet and madame d'espard in whose honour the dinner was given both ladies overwhelmed him with flatteries why did you turn your back on society when you would have been so well received asked the marquise every one was prepared to make much of you and i have a quarrel with you too you owed me a call i am still waiting to receive it i saw you at the opera the other day and you would not deign to come to see me nor to take any notice of me your cousin madame so unmistakably dismissed me oh you do not know women the marquise d'espard broke in upon him you have wounded the most angelic heart the noblest nature that i know you do not know all that louise was trying to do for you nor how tactfully she laid her plans for you oh and she would have succeeded the marquise continued replying to lucien's mute incredulity her husband is dead now died as he was bound to die of an indigestion could you doubt that she would be free sooner or later and can you suppose that she would like to be madame chardon it was worth while to take some trouble to gain the title of comtesse de rubempre love you see is a great vanity which requires the lesser vanities to be in harmony with itself especially in marriage i might love you to madness which is to say sufficiently to marry you and yet i should find it very unpleasant to be called madame chardon you can see that and now that you understand the difficulties of paris life you will know how many roundabout ways you must take to reach your end very well then you must admit that louise was aspiring to an all but impossible piece of court favour she was quite unknown she is not rich and therefore she could not afford to neglect any means of success you are clever the marquise d'espard continued but we women when we love are cleverer than the cleverest man my cousin tried to make that absurd chatelet useful oh she broke off i owe not a little amusement to you your articles on chatelet made me laugh heartily lucien knew not what to think of all this of the treachery and bad faith of journalism he had had some experience but in spite of his perspicacity 
he scarcely expected to find bad faith or treachery in society there were some sharp lessons in store for him but madame he objected for her words aroused a lively curiosity is not the heron under your protection one is obliged to be civil to one's worst enemies in society protested she one may be bored but one must look as if the talk was amusing and not seldom one seems to sacrifice friends the better to serve them are you still a novice you mean to write and yet you know nothing of current deceit my cousin apparently sacrificed you to the heron but how could she dispense with his influence for you our friend stands well with the present ministry and we have made him see that your attacks will do him service up to a certain point for we want you to make it up again some of these days chatelet has received compensations for his troubles for as des lupeaux said while the newspapers are making chatelet ridiculous they will leave the ministry in peace there was a pause the marquise left lucien to his own reflections monsieur blondet led me to hope that i should have the pleasure of seeing you in my house said the comtesse de montcornet you will meet a few artists and men of letters and some one else who has the keenest desire to become acquainted with you mademoiselle des touches the owner of talents rare among our sex you will go to her house no doubt mademoiselle des touches or camille maupin if you prefer it is prodigiously rich and presides over one of the most remarkable salons in paris she has heard that you are as handsome as you are clever and is dying to meet you lucien could only pour out incoherent thanks and glance enviously at emile blondet there was as great a difference between a great lady like madame de montcornet and coralie as between coralie and a girl out of the streets the countess was young and witty and beautiful with the very white fairness of women of the north her mother was the princess Sherbeloff and the minister before dinner had paid her the most respectful attention by this time the marquise had made an end of trifling disdainfully with the wing of a chicken my poor louise felt so much affection for you she said she took me into her confidence i knew her dreams of a great career for you she would have borne a great deal but what scorn you showed her when you sent back her letters cruelty we can forgive those who hurt us must have still some faith in us but indifference indifference is like polar snows it extinguishes all life so you must see that you have lost a precious affection through your own fault why break with her even if she had scorned you you had your way to make had you not your name to win back louise thought of all that then why was she silent eh mon dieu cried the marquise it was i myself who advised her not to take you into her confidence between ourselves you know you seemed so little used to the ways of the world that i took alarm i was afraid that your inexperience and rash ardour might wreck our carefully made schemes can you recollect yourself as you were then you must admit that if you could see your double to-day you would say the same yourself you are not like the same man that was our mistake but would one man in a thousand combine such intellectual gifts with such wonderful aptitude for taking the tone of society i did not think that you would be such an astonishing exception you were transformed so quickly you acquired the manner of paris so easily that i did not recognize you in the bois de boulogne a month ago lucien heard the great lady with inexpressible pleasure the flatteries were spoken with such a petulant childlike confiding air and she seemed to take such a deep interest in him that he thought of his first evening at the panorama dramatique and began to fancy that some such miracle was about to take place a second time everything had smiled upon him since that happy evening his youth he thought was the talisman that worked this change 
he would prove this great lady she should not take him unawares then what were these schemes which have turned to chimeras madame asked he louise meant to obtain a royal patent permitting you to bear the name and title of rubempre she wished to put chardon out of sight your opinions have put that out of question now but then it would not have been so hard to manage and a title would mean a fortune for you you will look on these things as trifles and visionary ideas she continued but we know something of life and we know too all the solid advantages of a count's title when it is borne by a fashionable and extremely charming young man announce monsieur chardon and monsieur le comte de rubempre before heiresses or english girls with a million to their fortune and note the difference of the effect the count might be in debt but he would find open hearts his good looks brought into relief by his title would be like a diamond in a rich setting monsieur chardon would not be so much as noticed we have not invented these notions they are everywhere in the world even among the bourgeois you are turning your back on fortune at this minute do you see that good-looking young man he is the vicomte felix de vandenesse one of the king's private secretaries the king is fond enough of young men of talent and vandenesse came from the provinces with baggage nearly as light as yours you are a thousand times cleverer than he but do you belong to a great family have you a name you know des lupoles his name is very much like yours for he was born a chardin well he would not sell his little farm of lupoles for a million he will be comte des lupoles some day and perhaps his grandson may be a duke you have made a false start and if you continue in that way it will be all over with you see how much wiser monsieur emile blondet has been he is engaged on a government newspaper he is well looked on by those in authority he can afford to mix with liberals for he holds sound opinions and sooner or later he will succeed but then he understood how to choose his opinions and his protectors your charming neighbor madame d'espard glanced at madame de montcornet was a troisville there are two peers of france in the family and two deputies she made a wealthy marriage with her name she sees a great deal of society at her house she has influence she will move the political world for young monsieur blondet where will a coralie take you in a few years time you will be hopelessly in debt and weary of pleasure you have chosen badly in love and you are arranging your life ill the woman whom you delight to wound was at the opera the other night and this was how she spoke of you she deplored the way in which you were throwing away your talent and the prime of youth she was thinking of you and not of herself all the while ah oh, if you were only telling me the truth madame cried lucien what object should i have in telling lies returned the marquise with a glance of cold disdain which annihilated him he was so dashed by it that the conversation dropped for the marquise was offended and said no more lucien was nettled by her silence but he felt that it was due to his own clumsiness and promised himself that he would repair his error he turned to madame de montcornet and talked to her of blondet extolling that young writer for her benefit the countess was gracious to him and asked him at a sign from madame d'espard to spend an evening at her house it was to be a small and quiet gathering to which only friends were invited madame de bargeton would be there in spite of her mourning lucien would be pleased she was sure to meet madame de bargeton madame la marquise says that all the wrong is on my side said lucien so surely it rests with her cousin does it not to decide whether she will meet me 
put an end to those ridiculous attacks which only couple her name with the name of a man for whom she does not care at all and you will soon sign a treaty of peace you thought that she had used you ill i am told but i myself have seen her in sadness because you had forsaken her is it true that she left the provinces on your account lucien smiled he did not venture to make any other reply oh how could you doubt the woman who made such sacrifices for you beautiful and intellectual as she is she deserves besides to be loved for her own sake and madame de bargeton cared less for you than for your talents believe me women value intellect more than good looks added the countess stealing a glance at emile blondet in the minister's hotel lucien could see the differences between the great world and that other world beyond the pale in which he had lately been living there was no sort of resemblance between the two kinds of splendor no single point in common the loftiness and disposition of the rooms in one of the handsomest houses in the faubourg saint germain the ancient gilding the breadth of decorative style the subdued richness of the accessories all this was strange and new to him but lucien had learned very quickly to take luxury for granted and he showed no surprise his behavior was as far removed from assurance or fatuity on the one hand as from complacency and servility upon the other his manner was good he found favor in the eyes of all who were not prepared to be hostile like the younger men who resented his sudden intrusion into the great world and felt jealous of his good looks and his success when they rose from table he offered his arm to madame d'espard and was not refused rastignac watching him saw that the marquise was gracious to lucien and came in the character of a fellow-countryman to remind the poet that they had met once before at madame du val noble's the young patrician seemed anxious to find an ally in the great man from his own province asked lucien to breakfast with him some morning and offered to introduce him to some young men of fashion lucien was nothing loath the dear blondet is coming said rastignac the two were standing near the marquis de roncarolles the duc de retore de marsay and general montriveau the minister came across to join the group well said he addressing lucien with a bluff german heartiness that concealed his dangerous subtlety well so you have made your peace with madame d'espard she is delighted with you and we all know he added looking round the group how difficult it is to please her yes but she adores intellect said rastignac and my illustrious fellow-countryman has wit enough to sell he will soon find out that he is not doing well for himself blondet put in briskly he will come over he will soon be one of us those who stood around lucien rang the changes on this theme the older and responsible men laid down the law with one or two profound remarks the younger ones made merry at the expense of the liberals he simply tossed up head or tails for right or left i am sure remarked blondet but now he will choose for himself lucien burst out laughing he thought of his talk with lousteau that evening in the luxembourg gardens he has taken on a bear leader continued blondet one etienne lousteau a newspaper hack who sees a five-franc piece in a column lousteau's politics consist in a belief that napoleon will return and and this seems to me to be still more simple in a confidence in the gratitude and patriotism of their worships the gentlemen of the left as a rubempre lucien's sympathies should lean towards the aristocracy as a journalist he ought to be for authority or he will never be either rubempre or a secretary-general the minister now asked lucien to take a hand at whist but to the great astonishment of those present he declared that he did not know the game come early to me on the day of that breakfast affair rastignac whispered and i will teach you to play 
you are a discredit to the royal city of angouleme and to repeat m de talleyrand's saying you are laying up an unhappy old age for yourself des lupeaules was announced he remembered lucien whom he had met at madame du val noble's and bowed with a semblance of friendliness which the poet could not doubt des lupeaules was in favor he was a master of requests and did the ministry secret services he was moreover cunning and ambitious slipping himself in everywhere he was everybody's friend for he never knew whom he might need he saw plainly that this was a young journalist whose social success would probably equal his success in literature saw too that the poet was ambitious and overwhelmed him with protestations and expressions of friendship and interest till lucien felt as if they were old friends already and took his promises and speeches for more than their worth des lupeaux made a point of knowing a man thoroughly well if he wanted to get rid of him or feared him as a rival so to all appearance lucien was well received he knew that much of his success was owing to the duc de rhetore the minister madame d'espard and madame de montcornet and went to spend a few moments with the two ladies before taking leave and talked his very best for them what a coxcomb said des lupeaux turning to the marquise when he had gone he will be rotten before he is ripe de marsay added smiling you must have private reasons of your own madame for turning his head in this way when lucien stepped into the carriage in the courtyard he found coralie waiting for him she had come to fetch him the little attention touched him he told her the history of his evening and to his no small astonishment the new notions which even now were running in his head met with coralie's approval she strongly advised him to enlist under the ministerial banner you have nothing to expect from the liberals but hard knocks she said they plot and conspire they murdered the duc de berry will they upset the government never you will never come to anything through them while you will be comte de rubempre if you throw in your lot with the other side you might render services to the state and be a peer of france and marry an heiress be an ultra it is the proper thing besides she added this being the last word with her on all subjects i dined with the val noble she told me that theodore gaillard is really going to start his little royalist review so as to reply to your witticisms and the jokes in the miroir to hear them talk monsieur villet's party will be in office before the year is out try to turn the change to account before they come to power and say nothing to etienne and your friends for they are quite equal to playing you some ill turn a week later lucien went to madame de montcornet's house and saw the woman whom he had so loved whom later he had stabbed to the heart with a jest he felt the most violent agitation at the sight of her for louise also had undergone a transformation she was the louise that she would always have been but for her detention in the provinces she was a great lady there was a grace and refinement in her mourning dress which told that she was a happy widow lucien fancied that this coquetry was aimed in some degree at him and he was right but like an ogre he had tasted flesh and all that evening he vacillated between coralie's warm voluptuous beauty and the dried-up haughty cruel louise he could not make up his mind to sacrifice the actress to the great lady and madame de bargeton all the old feeling reviving in her at the sight of lucien lucien's beauty lucien's cleverness was waiting and expecting that sacrifice all evening and after all her insinuating speeches and her fascinations she had her trouble for her pains she left the room with a fixed determination to be revenged well dear lucien she had said and in her kindness there was both generosity and parisian grace 
well dear lucien so you that were to have been my pride took me for your first victim and i forgave you my dear for i felt that in such a revenge there was a trace of love still left with that speech and the queenly way in which it was uttered madame de bargeton recovered her position lucien convinced that he was a thousand times in the right felt that he had been put in the wrong not one word of the causes of the rupture not one syllable of the terrible farewell letter a woman of the world has a wonderful genius for diminishing her faults by laughing at them she can obliterate them all with a smile or a question of feigned surprise and she knows this she remembers nothing she can explain everything she is amazed asks questions comments amplifies and quarrels with you till in the end her sins disappear like stains on the application of a little soap and water black as ink you knew them to be and lo in a moment you behold immaculate white innocence and lucky are you if you do not find that you yourself have sinned in some way beyond redemption in a moment old illusions regained their power over lucien and louise they talked like friends as before but when the lady with a hesitating sigh put the question are you happy lucien was not ready with a prompt decided answer he was intoxicated with gratified vanity coralie who let us admit it had made life easy for him had turned his head a melancholy no would have made his fortune but he must needs begin to explain his position with regard to coralie he said that he was loved for his own sake he said a good many foolish things that a man will say when he is smitten with a tender passion and thought the while that he was doing a clever thing madame de bargeton bit her lips there was no more to be said madame d'espard brought madame de montcornet to her cousin and lucien became the hero of the evening so to speak he was flattered petted and made much of by the three women he was entangled with art which no words can describe his social success in this fine and brilliant circle was at least as great as his triumphs in journalism beautiful mademoiselle des touches so well known as camille maupin asked him to one of her wednesday dinners his beauty now so justly famous seemed to have made an impression upon her lucien exerted himself to show that his wit equalled his good looks and mademoiselle des touches expressed her admiration with a playful outspokenness and a pretty fervor of friendship which deceives those who do not know life in paris to its depths nor suspect how continual enjoyment whets the appetite for novelty if she should like me as much as i like her we might abridge the romance said lucien addressing de marsay and rastignac you both of you write romances too well to care to live them returned rastignac can men and women who write ever fall in love with each other a time is sure to come when they begin to make little cutting remarks it would not be a bad dream for you laughed de marsay the charming young lady is thirty years old it is true but she has an income of eighty thousand livres she is adorably capricious and her style of beauty wears well coralie is a silly little fool my dear boy well enough for a start for a young spark must have a mistress but unless you make some great conquest in the great world an actress will do you harm in the long run now my boy go and cut out conti here he is just about to sing with camille maupin poetry has taken precedence of music ever since time began but when lucien heard mademoiselle des touches voice blending with conti's his hopes fled conti sings too well he told des lupeaules and he went back to madame de bargeton who carried him off to madame d'espard in another room well will you not interest yourself in him asked madame de bargeton 
the marquise spoke with an air half kindly half insolent let monsieur chardon first put himself in such a position that he will not compromise those who take an interest in him she said if he wishes to drop his patronymic and to bear his mother's name he should at any rate be on the right side should he not in less than two months i will arrange everything said lucien very well returned madame d'espard i will speak to my father and uncle they are in waiting they will speak to the chancellor for you End of chapter twenty four